Amen. <laughs> uh, the message I'm going to preach this morning, in my estimation, is one of the most important that I'll ever preach, especially since we come down to the second advent of Christ, and I believe he's coming soon. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 with me this morning, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and verse number 1. Second Thessalonians 2, 1. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Amen. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Amen. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Father, bless this blessed book now. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. When you consider that this was written 2,000 years ago, it makes it even more profound. And when you consider that in 2015, you live in a country that is becoming anti-Christ every day that you live in it, a Supreme Court now has outlawed Christian, outlawed uh, biblical marriage. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, in uh, Roe versus Wade opened the floodgates of the murder of the innocent unborn. 70 million babies now have died at the hands of the Supreme Court that uh, made it legal. Christians now are enduring persecution throughout this land and the persecution will only increase you might as well get ready for it. I don't want to be up here a prophet of gloom and doom, but I want to tell you the truth. You can live in your own little bubble and make everything think that it's hunky-dory and everything is okay and run as long as you can run, but you're going to face the reality that this nation is turning against God. And it is turning against your Christian faith. I don't know if this next election, election that's coming up, I don't know if it's going to change anything or not. But I know that if you are a conscientious citizen of this nation, if you're patriotic, that you're going you're gonna to look very carefully at the candidates, what they stand for, and then when you go vote, you should go vote. If you don't think you should go vote, you ought to watch a documentary of Iwo Jima when the Marines went to Mount Sarabachi and planted that flag, and they fought for another three or four days, and tens of thousands died on that thing. It was a blackened island out there in the Pacific, and they wanted that because it gave them a landing strip that would allow them to get closer to Japan and hopefully bring an end to the World War II where over 50 million people died. And consider the blood that was shed on D-Day in Normandy when those men hit Omaha Beach and the other beaches and they were machine gunned to death. And I'd like to run a survey. I've often wondered what it would be like if we could take all the old veterans of World War II and Vietnam and Korea, the so-called Forgotten War, and then Desert Storm and all these other wars that have been fought since then, if we could take all those old veterans that went out there and, and, and hazarded their lives for this nation and run a survey among them and ask them what they thought constituted a marriage and ask those veterans what they thought, uh, that, thought that the pillar and foundation of America was established on, I'd like to know what they'd say. I believe you'd be surprised. I believe they'd be so far removed from this Supreme Court 
and from this political correct crowd that you couldn't imagine it. At home, I have an old New Testament. It's just a little thing. It's about this wide and that high. It has a patina on it to show you that it's aged. That New Testament was issued to a soldier in World War II. Yeah. I thought this was quite a remarkable thing, that our government gave the Word of God yeah. out to our soldiers and, they, and, and, and sailors and Marines and Air Force in World War II. They handed them the Scripture yeah. so that when they would go into combat that they'd have God's Word that they could take hold of. That was the America of 1940. Big difference between the America of 1940 and 2050. What happened? How much have we set on our, on our duff and allowed this to happen around us? When will we wake up and do something about it? When will you, get a, when will you wake up out of your religion and decide that it's time to do something when it comes time to vote? When will you come out of your stupor and say, wait a minute, my children are going to hell, babies are dying around me, and it won't be long before I won't even be able to practice my Christian faith. Amen. And that if I name the name of Christ on the job site, I get fired. And the people that I work with call me a hater, they call me a bigot, they call me all these names. When will that, is that gonna change? No, it's not gonna change, it's gonna get worse, folks. Right. Here's the problem. I live in the trenches. I live on the front line. I don't spend my weeks in front of a television set enjoying movies and, and, and being entertained and, and let my mind go off in, into some kind of a world where I don't deal with the, with the reality of the life in this world. I'm on the front line. I spend hours every day reading the newspapers and websites and researching and seeing what's happened to our people and what's happening to Christians. And it gets to you after a while when you come to a church that you've pastored for nearly 40 years and half the people don't give a flip. They don't give a flip. Amen. It makes you just want to pack your Bible up and open your toolbox up and go back to work as a mechanic. I'm a professional mechanic. I could go back anywhere. I could make a living as a mechanic. It just makes you want to say, what's the use? Is there any use? Is there not a cause? I'm going to preach you a message this morning about those people that are telling you now that the church is going to go through the rapture. I believe personally that this is part of the great deception that Satan's dropping on all of us. Let me give you a test of the deception right now. If you're not bothered by the death of 70 million babies, little innocent children, Deception is settling in on your soul right now. You are deceived. You're deceived. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he said that the day of Christ shall not come except there come a falling away first. Every one of the new Bibles, without exception, calls that the day of the Lord. And what does he say? Is that a big deal, preacher? It's a very big deal. Because the day of the Lord is the tribulation period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time when all hell breaks loose on this earth. I hear these guys out here, and they're, they're up in front of their people, and they're teaching, they're talking about it. Well, some of them are saying, well, we're in the tribulation now. Son, you live in a cave. When the real tribulation hits this earth, it will not, you won't even be able to live through it unless you have the grace of God. For the Bible says, except those days should be short and no flesh should be left alive. So the great deception is settling in. It's settling. Now let's find out this morning what's going on with this. We have people now that are, that are in, in this church and, and around me that are saying, well, now, preacher, and I believe now the church is going to go through the tribulation. We have preachers now that are banding their position on the pre-tribulation rapture, and they're saying, I believe the church is going to go through the tribulation. I'm going to talk about that this morning. I'm going to talk about how important it is. Because if you believe the church is going through the tribulation, you're looking for the Antichrist and not the true Christ. You're looking for the man of sin and not the Lord Jesus to come and take us away. You're looking at this earth and not the one who's coming from heaven to call us out of here, to meet him in the clouds. The Old Testament saint believed in a resurrection. 
In the book of Job, he said, though, my, he said, though the skin worms destroy this uh, body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I, my, who I will see for myself and not another. He knew that he'd be raised from the dead. He knew it. He knew it without a shadow of a doubt. That was 1,900 years before Christ. When the Lord Jesus came to the tomb of uh, Lazarus, Martha met him, and the Lord Jesus said, Martha, your brother shall rise. She said, yea, Lord, I know he'll rise in the last day at the resurrection. And the Lord corrected her in a gentle manner. For she had in her mind a general resurrection that would take place at the end of the age. The Lord Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection. The resurrection now is no longer an event, it's a person. The Lord Jesus being the second man, last Adam, therefore is the resurrection. In plainer words, the future is Christ and all souls will hear his voice. John chapter number five, he said, the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So there's no doubt in anybody's mind, anybody that believed the Bible, any Jew that had a, had a cursory understanding of Scripture, he knew that a resurrection was coming. That's good. That's a good foundational truth. And that is the truth. But that's not all the truth. It is the truth that the dead will come forth. The Bible says that they that sleep in the dust of the ground shall come forth. They will come forth. It's an Old Testament doctrine, a New Testament doctrine. But here's the key. The key is that the church of the living God has an entirely different message revealed to it about the resurrection than was revealed to the Old Testament saints or even to the saints during the time of Christ. They didn't understand it. They didn't know it. It was not until the apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, taken into Arabia, and there God revealed to him the rapture of the church of God, which was a mystery. Now all we've got to do is locate that rapture, locate that mystery. In, 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, the New Testament in my New Testament, which is the Bible, this is the Word of God, this King James Bible, God's inspired Word, Holy Bible, says that the day of Christ shall not come except that man of sin be revealed. Now, if you make that the day of the Lord, then you're going to take that and use that as proof text along with other, other texts that the church is going to be in the tribulation period because the day of the Lord is the tribulation into the millennium. The day of the Lord lasts for 1,007 years. That's how long the day of the Lord lasts. But the day of Christ only lasts for seven years. And the day of Christ is not the day of the Lord. They're entirely two different things. The day of Christ is the day of Christ and his bride. Catch to be caught up to meet him in the clouds. To be with him for seven years. At the end of that seven year period of time, they're coming back with him. During that seven year period of time, you'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. You'll have the saints of God that are caught up from the tribulation period. Many of them enjoying that presence of Christ during the tribulation period. But the seven years is the time of Jacob's trouble for this earth. It's the great tribulation and it's coming. It's coming. It's at the door. It's closer than you think. If in a year from now, we're still here on Woodrow Drive, you will probably have more of your freedoms taken away and you will probably be more demonized than you are now. And the name Christian will be spit from the faces of these people in this country. And you will be hated for his name's sake. It's coming, folks. It's coming. It's coming. Can I get that over to you? It's coming. It's coming. How many of you can see what I'm saying? It's coming. A Catholic group just the other day, went to Office Depot. They wanted to get a flyer made because this flyer was about the abortions. I think the Roe versus Wade, uh, uh, isn't the anniversary or something close? Anyway, the Catholic group wanted to get Office Depot to make a flyer for them 
to hand out as it related to abortion. Office Depot employees read the flyer as it related to abortion and sent back to the Catholic group and said, we're not going to make this. This is hate speech. Now, these Roman Catholics are trying to save babies. And the Office Depot refused to print it. So they went to the manager. The manager says, I agree with my, with my employees. We're not going to print this for you because this is hate speech. Now, think. In Kentucky, a clerk refuses to marry, hand, hand out licenses to sodomites to be married. She is hauled off to jail. Why? Because she is a public person in a public place refusing to, 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 to do what someone who comes to a public place, she refuses to do it for them. What is the difference between that and the Roman Catholic group that goes to Office Depot to have a flyer printed because it's a public place that caters to the public. They're going to come in there and going to pay their money and they refuse to do it for them and they call it hate speech. And since it's hate speech, it's justified in this country, they can kill you. <coughs> have you heard anything from the news media? Have you heard any judges throwing them in jail? You know why? Because they've got a double standard in America. Christian, wake up. They hate you. Christian, wake up. I will probably be in jail in six months or a year or two. I don't know how long it'll be, but I plan on going to jail. Why? Because when I preach the word of God, I'm going to be accused of preaching hate speech and hate speech is going to get me thrown into jail and I don't know, will it wake up the Christians then? You know what I'd love to see in America? I'd like to see the Christians so mad. Oh, I'd like to see them mad. And I'd like to see them drop their little little Mickey Mouse, Penny Annie differences. I'm not talking about real doctrinal truths. I'm talking about junk. And come together and say, hold on, we are losing our nation. And if we don't do something about it, it's gone down the tubes. And I believe that those, I think it's, uh, I think it's 10,000 at Normandy. I don't remember how many, how many graves are over there. Of those young boys, 18, 19, 20 years old, that died machine gunned to death on the beaches of Normandy. Yeah. 1944, June the 6th, they were invading Europe to go drive eventually to Berlin and take, and take Hitler out of power. I wonder how many of them, if they knew what was going on in America right now, I wonder what they'd have to say. Isn't it a shame they don't have a voice? Isn't it a shame that the 70 million babies that are murdered in this country, that have been murdered in this country since Roe versus Wade, they don't have a voice? You're talking about a monster. Are you listening to me? I'm talking about a monster. These are bloodthirsty killers. They're not playing with you. They'll come into your house and they'll drag you out the door and they'll throw you in a jail cell in a heartbeat once they've got it where they want it. I don't know if we've passed the point in America where you can turn it around. I don't know. I know God can do anything. And I know well-meaning people say, God bless America. He's quit blessing America. Blessings are over. Why should he bless this place? Why would God bless America when you got blood on babies or little babies on your hand? Why would God bless America when they've outlawed the Christian faith? Why would God bless America when they're joining sodomites together and the, and the government gave its approval? Why would God bless this place? Think about it. Think about it. Why would he bless this place? Well, I'm an American, but God's not an American. I'm an American. Well, Jesus is not an American. 
That little Nigerian boy that gets down on his knees and cries out to the Lord Jesus Christ will find the same grace of God to save him as that little boy in Chicago or Los Angeles or Knoxville, Tennessee. Makes no difference. He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't salute anybody's flag. He's the sovereign of the universe. The only reason America is still America is because God's a gracious God and he's long suffering. And will he see anything change in this nation? Will the church go through the tribulation period, preacher? No. Say, why won't it go through the tribulation? Because we're the bride of Christ. The church of God is a mystery in its essence. It's a mystery in its beginning. It's a mystery in its future. And it's a mystery in its departure. The church of God is all about a mystery. This is a mysterious thing. We don't even know what make, constitutes the body of Christ. Do you know that? We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Somebody define that for me. <laughs> It'd be like trying to define the essence of a spirit. You can't do it, but it's a reality. If you're born again, you belong to Christ and he belongs to you. We're in him and he's in us. That's called the reciprocal indwelling of Christ. It's a marvelous truth. There are so many truths in the Bible, folks, that I believe, but I can't understand them. I'll just be honest with you. I'll confess up right now. There's a whole lot of stuff in the Bible that I believe with all of my soul, but I, can't, I don't even hazard to try to figure it out. But I believe it. Why? Because I believe the Bible. I don't waste my time with these Bible deniers and, and critics and chopping up my book and all that. If they'd ever opened up that book and let the one who wrote that book come into their soul, the Holy Ghost that came from that from the Word of God, ever let him come into their heart one time, they'd no longer be opening the Bible as its critic. They'd let the Bible speak to them. Amen. That's what's wrong. Everybody is so pumped up, so pumped up. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions quickly. If you believe the church will go through the tribulation, I've got some questions for you. All right? These are simple questions. Number one, how does the new birth and eternal security fit with a clear statement, Matthew 24, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, it means, they don't care what, what does it say? It says that the tribulation saint must endure to the end in order to be saved. That's what it says. It says it's a conditional thing. But the Bible says that I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. The Bible says I'm bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. The Bible says I am in the palm of his hand. No man can pluck me from that hand. The Bible said I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. I am a son of God by the new birth. Eternally saved, hallelujah. Capped by the power of God. But a tribulation saint is not so. So now, dear friend, if you're going to get up and tell people they're going to go through the tribulation, you've got a problem on your hands. You've got a big problem because you've got, to, you've got to figure out how that eternal security and this conditional thing figure. What you'll do, wind up doing, is throwing eternal security out the door, and that's what they do. And then, my friend, you're in trouble. You realize that if you're not trusting in the, in, the, in the salvation of God to keep you, save you, keep you, seal you, then you're trusting in yourself. Did you know in the tribulation period, it says in the book of Revelation chapter number 6, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were beheaded for the word of God. Folks, every saint of God in this house right here, if you're born again, you don't go to the grave. You immediately go to be with the Lord. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That gives me great comfort. Because sometimes I get so heavenly minded, so caught up there thinking about glory, I think to myself, I'll be so much better off if I just next breath I drew, it'd be in heaven walking down streets of pure transparent gold. Oh man, the apostle Paul said to be absent is to be with the Lord, which is far greater. But the tribulation saint is under the altar. Well, that's symbolic. Oh, I see. Then you allow yourself some wiggle room, don't you? There's nothing symbolic about it. Tribulation saints don't go immediately to heaven. Tribulation saints go back down to that place called paradise to be taken out of it once again to be carried up into the presence of the Lord. But see, that's a mess you get into. Question number two. 
How does the gospel of the grace of God fit with the everlasting gospel? Turn to Revelation 14 and I'll show it to you. <coughs> Revelation chapter number 14, verse 6. Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now watch it. He's going to tell you what it is. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. But look carefully. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. What's it saying? It's saying acknowledge him as the creator, Lord, and master. There's not a word in that gospel about the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God that called you by his grace to save your soul. That is an entirely different gospel than the grace of God. And it is in the tribulation period. What kind of a pastor would you think I'd be if you came in here week after week after week after week and heard me get up in the pulpit and here's what I'd be preaching to you. You fear God. You keep his commandments. You give glory to the Lord. You acknowledge him as the Lord, as the master. You acknowledge him as the creator and the sustainer. And you hear that from me week after week after week after week. You say, preacher, that's the truth. It is the truth. It's not all the truth. Because here's the truth. You're a sinner. You're under the condemnation of God. You're lost without God. And you can't be saved except by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and died and shed his blood, that you have your sins washed away. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You receive him into your heart and into your soul, and he'll save you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life. I just gave you the grace of God. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. It's not, there's nothing in the grace of God about fearing God and keeping his commandments. There's nothing in there about that. And of those of you in here this morning who've heard what I've said, you, you say to yourself, well then preacher, are you telling me that during this period of time that everything changes from what it is now? Yes. When's the last time you saw a pit open up and creatures come up out of that pit, half human, half animal, half demon? When's the last time you saw 200 million horsemen come across a river that had been dried up? When was the last time you saw demons manifest themselves physically as unclean frogs, unclean spirits as frogs, going forth from the mouth of the beast and the false prophet? When was the last time you saw the whole ocean out here, a third of it, turn to blood? And you could smell the stench coming up off of it and the fish in the sea die? When was the last time you saw the grass on the earth as it began to brown, wither, and die? When was the last time you saw a mighty angel come down from God out of heaven and a mighty angel manifest itself to all humanity and put one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea and declare, time is no more. Amen. Folks, the tribulation period is all about what you can see. Yeah. <laughs> Think about that. That which is not seen is faith. We're not seeing that kind of thing right now. But they will see it. And then an antichrist steps out and his false prophet and he calls fire down from heaven and has power to give life to an image of a beast and has power in his voice. And this antichrist, they wage war against him and who can war against the antichrist? Nobody can. He has power and authority on the earth like men have never seen. And people start taking his mark. Which brings me to the next point. In Revelation chapter number 13, there are three things mentioned about the antichrist. Three. They're very important. His number, his mark, his name. Now the Lord's been gracious to us and he's given us his number. He's given us his number. What's his number? 666. All right. But what's his mark? I got on the internet and did a little research into it. And here's what they said. This is just one website. These are good people. These are good people. They mean well. But listen to this. The mark of the beast will be a literal, physical combination of letters and symbols. It will be permanently and prominently engraved or tattooed in the forehead or right hand of each person who gets the mark of the beast. 
The mark of the beast will include one of the beast's 666 names. Each of the 666 names will be a name for God. The beast is Satan coming to earth looking like God and saying he is God. Each of his names will be blasphemous because he is not God. Does the mark of the beast look nice? The mark of the beast will look attractive and beautiful. It will please the senses and will excite the admiration of those who see it. Most people who wear it will be proud to have it. The mark will be plainly visible for all to see. Your friends and family will be able to see if you have received the mark. Your employer can look at you and see the mark. When you go shopping, the store clerk will be able to see if you are wearing the mark of the beast. All right? This has elements of the truth in it, but it is so fanciful. What do you mean, a combination of letters and symbols? Not one scripture. How many of you in this house this morning have really thought about the mark? What is the mark? Somebody said, well, it's, that, it's, it's an implantable chip. They put it under the skin, yeah. under here. Or they put a chip up here, or they tattoo something up here, they tattoo something down here. Yeah. All kinds of speculation about what the mark of the beast is. Here's the bottom line. Nobody knows what it is. Now think about that for a minute. And think about the Lord saying in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, For this cause, what cause? They love not the truth. I'm going to send them a strong delusion that they should be alive, a lie and be damned. If you are sitting there comfortable this morning, you're a good little Baptist. And it doesn't bother you what this country's going to hell in a handbasket, and it is. And I'm to keep telling you about all these babies dying around you. And you, you're sitting there, and everything's hunky dory with you. You are a prime candidate for the mark. You know why? You've already been deceived. You're already deceived. And when the great day comes and God sends that mantle of deception down, you'll have no hope. And here's why you'll have no hope. You had the truth, the blazing light of the gospel of Christ. I just preached the gospel to you a moment ago, and you rejected it. So wait a minute, preacher. I accept everything you said about Christ. I believe all of that. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again the third day. I believe all that. Yeah, but it doesn't do anything for your life. And if what you believe up here in your head doesn't work itself out in the way you live, you're believing intellectually and not with the heart. Amen. When you believe with the heart, it'll change your life. And this nation is full of people who believe up here. I saw a sign in front of an Anglican church, and it said, Listen up, Christians. Gay people are here, and God loves them like he loves you. Get over it. I'm glad they're honest about this. They were addressing Christians because they're not. You notice how they said it? Christians. Now, the deception is already settling in. How do you know you're deceived? Think about Lot. How many of you would take Lot and use him as an illustration of a righteous man? And a, how, many of you, how many of you would run Lot up in front of your youth group or, or the ladies' meeting or somewhere and say, now, Lot, give us your testimony and tell us what it was like being the, being the gate man at Sodom and, you know, and all that you've been through down there. Tell us all about it. Not a one of you in here would. And you know what Lot did? His daughters got him drunk, and Moab and Ammon came from it. But did you know what Peter said about Lot? He said, seeing the filthy conversation of the wicked, in other words, the way they lived, he said it vexed his righteous soul. That bugs me. It's bugged me for I don't know how long. It bothers me. It bothers me. The Bible says that Lot was continually upset because of the way the Sodomites were living around him. He was upset with it. It vexed his soul. And yet Lot is no great champion of righteousness. See, the point is that if you've got anything of holiness in you, if there's any real faith in your soul, 
There ought to be enough going on right now to stir you up to where you're really worried and bothered because you believe the Lord's coming back soon. Amen. That's a remarkable thing, too, when you think about that because I see it. Even churches like this one right here, and you, you hear the gospel <laughs> ad nauseum. You're worn out with it. You're gospel hardened. You get it every week. Yet a lot of you can't wait to get out that back door and get right back out into the world living the way you've been living. And you won't give God a second thought for another week. And then you'll waltz in and give him a little time, maybe, maybe not, and then go right back out into the world. Yet you think everything is okay with God. Not, folks. It's not. I'm ready to go, are you? Yeah. I'm ready to drop dead right now. Yeah. I am. There's a few I'd like to say goodbye to. <laughs> That's all. Just say goodbye to them. I don't have any banks to go to. I don't have any business deals to, to uh, wrap up. I just There's a few I'd like to look them in the eye and say bye. That's it. Bye. Ready to go. The church is not mentioned one time in the book of Revelation. Do you know that after John's caught up? If you believe the church is going through the tribulation, how do you figure that? At any given time, if you believe the church is going through the tribulation, you believe it's going to be at least seven years before the Lord comes back. A minimum, seven years, because the tribulation is seven years long. You're looking for the man of sin and not the Lord. Now, I mentioned his number at 666. His mark, we don't know what it is, but then the Bible says his name. What do you think his name is? Anybody got any ideas in the back of your mind who you think the Antichrist could be? <laughs> I won't argue with you, brother. <laughs> no. Isn't that something? To think that the president of this republic could be the Antichrist? Did you know that I saw a photograph yesterday of a fly right here? And a fly right here? And that he was with a meeting in a group somewhere and the fly started swarming around him? And that he was up in a lectern and a rat ran across in front of him? And they say that there's a foul odor at times in the White House? Coming out? Do you know what Beelzebub means? <laughs> Lord of flies. You know how flies feed their babies? On dead flesh. We call them maggots. Then they become a fly. In other words, there's nothing clean about a fly. Flies. Beelzebub, Lord of flies. Is he the Antichrist? I don't know. But he's no Christian. He's no Christian. So, if you believe the church is going to go through the tribulation period, you believe you can lose your salvation. If you believe you can lose your salvation, then you don't know anything about the grace of God. You don't understand, about the, you understand anything about the body of Christ. I explained to you that everything in the tribulation period is visible. It's all visible, visible. It's what you see, you see, you see, you see. And we don't live like that now. And finally, I want to close with this. Most of the people today in America, in one form or another, well, most of the pastors, the reverends in this country, in one form, in one subtle form or nuance of a form or another, are preaching a prosperity gospel. They're preaching about now, get your wealth and your health and everything here and now. One of them, one of their gurus has just published a book recently which says, your best life now. You get that? No longer the pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. It's about what's going on right now. All right. Let me say this. If you are a prosperity preacher, that means that you have bought into your life in this earth and that your hope is here. That means that you will do whatever you need to do to get along. That means that you're smart and you're cunning and you'll watch the way the spirit flows in whatever country you're in. 
And as you can see in America, it is beginning to flow clearly against real born-again believers. We're demonized. We're called idiots. All kinds of terms for us. You will therefore begin to divorce yourself from them with little messages or this or that. You will remove yourself from them, yet all the time calling yourself a Christian. You are deceived and you are deceiving others. A prosperity preacher will surely take the mark of the beast when it shows up. You will take it. And the reason you'll take it is because you have rejected the light of the truth of God. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the true Christ. I will see the Antichrist. And in my estimation, I agree with this brother right here, we've probably seen him. But I can't be sure of that. I can't be sure of it. But that's how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Now let me warn you this morning. If the Lord comes back, he's going to come for his bride. It could be at any moment. Bang, just like that we leave. This is the apple of his eye. This is his love in the Song of Solomon. He's coming for her. He's coming to take her. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. He's coming to get us. And he's taken us to be with him. Because he loves us and we love him. But if you miss that and you're left behind, the first thing that will strike your soul is terror like you've never known before. You'll come to the church house. You'll come, you'll come flying to the church house to wait to, to find out who's here. And there'll be others just like you that'll show up here. How many, I don't know, but you'll be full of terror because it'll strike your soul that you missed the rapture. That's no indication that you're doomed for hell. But the indication is that you're a candidate for the mark. It depends on God Almighty and His judgment on your soul as to whether or not you've had the light and you've rejected it and God sends a strong delusion on you. This nation, along with the world, will have a multitude that is too large to count that are saved out of the tribulation period. You might be one of them. My warning to you this morning is this. You may never have been convicted in your life. You may never have come under the convicting hand of God. It's never bothered you. So therefore you make fun of people who are Christians and you, you don't understand what they've been through. So you've never known conviction. And the Lord takes his church away. Let me warn you, don't take the mark. Amen. If they gotta cut your head off, don't take the mark. Amen. Whatever you gotta do, don't take the mark. Amen. I don't know what that mark is, but don't take it. Don't take it. Here's the, here's, here's the key. God will send a strong delusion on every mankind, every one of mankind on the face of this earth that he wants to delude. But there will be those who refuse to take the mark and they won't be deluded. See what I mean? They'll know the difference. They'll know to reject it. And they'll, say, they'll know to say no. And that's the only hope there is in this world after the church is gone are for those that aren't deluded. So prosperity preacher, you're going to hell. Prosperity preacher, you're going to go to hell because you're a prosperity preacher and your life is here and you're deceived and you're deceiving many just like you. You say, that made me mad, preacher. Then get on your knees and get right with God and get saved before you go to hell. My dear friend, I don't want to see anybody in this house go to hell. I don't want to see you go to hell. I don't want to see you go to hell. I'm taking joy in that. Thank God I'm not going to hell. Thank God I'm not going to hell. But if you're in this house this morning and you don't know for certain where you're going, if you were to die right now, you could, die, you could be dead in five minutes. You could be dead in five minutes. And you don't know where you're going, I beg you in the name of Jesus. Why don't you get up and walk down here? Come on down here and let somebody open a Bible and show you how to be saved where you don't have to go to hell. You can be born again. He died for you too. You understand? He died for every soul in the tribulation period, whether saved or lost. He died for all of them. He tasted death for every man. You can be saved. Father, in thy name you pr I pray, Lord, I've delivered my soul. Their blood's not on my hands anymore. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd speak to them. I pray you'd speak to those who've watched this thing over the Internet. I pray for that you'll speak to them who watch this thing later on a DVD or something. I pray for all of them. I pray for them in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you be merciful and gracious. And let them call on thy holy name and be saved. In thy name we pray. Amen.